Hello, my name is Sarah Keating, Acting Consul General at the Consul General of Ireland in Chicago. I'm delighted to join you here today for the launch of this wonderful film, The Famine Irish in Chicago. Famine Irish in Chicago is hosted by the National Famine Museum Strokestown Park and the Irish Heritage Trust as part of the Great Famine Voices 2022 season, which is funded by the Government of Ireland through the Emigrant Support Programme. The film features Professor Sean Farrell from Northern Illinois University, who is the co-author with Matthew Billings of The Irish in Illinois. Professor Farrell is a true wealth of knowledge on Irish history and a great resource to the people of Illinois and further afield. The Government of Ireland is committed to continuing to commemorate the famine, both at home and in the United States, and just recently announced that this year's National Famine Commemoration will take place at the National Famine Museum Strokestown Park on Sunday the 15th of May. The famine destroyed lives and it wiped out families. It made a million people refugees, forced to flee their country for survival. Many of those who fled came here to the US and more specifically to Illinois and Chicago. They made lives for themselves here, raised families, developed com communities and contributed hugely to the America that we know today. It is very fitting that we are launching this film on the birthday of one of those such immigrants. May 1st or May Day, the birthday of Mary Harris, better known as Mother Jones. Mother Jones herself is featured in the film as an immigrant who contributed so much to American life. Her legacy continues today and continues to resonate in today's world. Mother Jones' story is a remarkable one. As a young girl, she left Cork and crossed the Atlantic with her family. They settled in Toronto and then later came to the US. Her time here was not easy. Losing her husband and children to yellow fever, she then moved to Chicago and opened a dressmakers, which was sadly burned during the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. In the early 20th century, she emerged as an advocate for the rights of workers. She became one of the most famous women in America because of this advocacy. And when she died, she was buried at Mount Olive Cemetery in Illinois and a huge monument was built there by the miners in her memory. Last year, the consulate in Chicago and the embassy in Washington, D.C. were honored to unveil two portraits of Mother Jones in our offices. These portraits were painted by artist Lindsay Hand, who did a fantastic job in capturing the strength of this remarkable woman. These portraits now hang proudly in our public space as a reminder of both Mother Jones's own contribution and the contribution of countless immigrant women and men to their new home in America. In October of 1999, more than 800 people gathered in Chicago's Gaelic Park to mark the 150th anniversary of the Irish famine. The centerpiece of the event was the unveiling of the Irish Famine Memorial Monument. Framed by a stylized stone wall, the massive bronze relief depicts a destitute but upright family of five being evicted from their home a husband, wife, and their three children. The memorial also features the symbols of loss that dominate Irish and Irish diasporic narratives of the famine. A Celtic cross, a coffin ship, a harp, and a potato. 
In a public interview, Father Anthony Branken, the artist and a former priest at St. Thomas More Church on the southwest side of Chicago, made clear his intent in creating the memorial. I wanted to convey the very human suffering. People starve to death. On another level, the monument underlines the myriad ways that the Irish famine is intertwined with the history of Chicago. Famine stories are there from the very beginning. For many Chicagoans, they still speak with a power that feels all too real. The Irish famine transformed modern Irish society as one million people died and an estimated two million fled the island between 1845 and 1855. 1.8 million of these emigrants settled in the United States and Canada, mostly in cities on the eastern coast, Boston, Montreal, New York City, Philadelphia, and the like. Thousands, however, journeyed further west where they found relatively higher wages and more opportunities in emergent communities with less embedded or entrenched political and social establishment. Chicago was one of these places. At the time of the Irish famine, Chicago was a new community, incorporated in 1837, just one year after the Illinois State Legislature authorized the creation of the Illinois and Michigan Canal a massive infrastructure project that brought a disproportionately Irish labor force to the region. Chicago is typically described as an instant or shock city, a new urban center rapidly forged in the 1840s and 1850s by a boom of human and natural resources in spite of stringent environmental limits. Irish migrants were responsible for much of this early growth many of them brought to the American Midwest by the Irish Famine. In 1840-41, Chicago had a population of roughly 4,500 people. Ten years later, the population had surged to nearly 30,000, a remarkable 570% increase. Over 6,000 of these men, women, and children had been born in Ireland slightly over 20% of the population of the city. Immigration, of course, continued to fuel Chicago's meteoric growth. By 1890, America's second city had nearly 1.1 million inhabitants, a sizable proportion of whom were Irish. Whatever the measure, the general point is certainly clear enough. Irish emigrants were central to the making of modern Chicago a city made in part by the Irish famine. There's been a lot of excellent work on the Chicago Irish, most of it focusing on the period between 1880 and 1930, an era when the Irish emerged to play a dominant role in the city's social and political life. What I wanna do in this brief talk is to focus on an earlier period looking in particular at two of the ways that Chicago's modern history is intertwined with the famine. First, the early history of the Catholic Church in the city, and especially the roles of the female religious in building the social infrastructure of Chicago. Secondly, we will examine the canal workers of the Illinois and Michigan Canal and their rich legacies and connections in Illinois politics. The talk will conclude with a brief consideration of the ways that two notable 19th and early 20th century figures, Mother Jones and Finley Peter Dunn, talked about the Irish famine, underlining the ways that the Chicago Irish kept on Gorta Moore at the heart of their own Chicago stories. With a rapidly growing population and little social infrastructure, it's no surprise that the Catholic Church played a central role in community formation in Chicago in the 1840s. Nor was this a transitory phenomenon. For many of the Chicago Irish, Catholicism long remained a primary point of identity. The parish was a building block of everyday life. The first Bishop of Chicago was William J. Quarter, born in 1806 in County Offaly, then Kings County. 
After working closely with Bishop John Hughes in New York City, Porter was appointed bishop in the new diocese of Chicago in late 1843. When he arrived the following year, Corder faced the monumental task of building the church from veritable scratch. Working with a feverish energy that doubtless contributed to his early death at the age of 42 in 1848, Corder led the charge to build St. Mary's Cathedral on the corner of Madison and Wabash and then raised the funds to work off the debt. If Irish men ran the Catholic Church, however, it was Irish women who were at the forefront of the provision of social and spiritual care for the poor, a particularly important position given the social needs of famine emigrants. The key figures here were the Sisters of Mercy, the first religious order to establish themselves in Chicago. The order itself was founded by Catherine Macaulay in 1831 in Dublin. The sisters thereby quickly came to be known as the walking nuns, both in Ireland and America, a reflection of their focus on the world as their workplace. Guided by Macaulay's admonition that the poor, the illiterate, and the sick need help today, not next week, the Sisters of Mercy were encouraged to go into the middle of a perverse world. As historian Sue Ellen Hoy has put it, they've opened orphanages, staffed schools, cared for cholera victims in their homes, nursed the sick in the injured in makeshift hospitals, visited prisoners, helped secure employment for the jobless, and sheltered the abandoned. They were, in short, a perfect match for Chicago's needs in the 1840s and 50s. Bishop Corder recognized their value, and the Sisters of Mercy quickly answered his call for help with their arrival in 1846. Five nuns, all under the age of 25, accompanied by Mother Frances Xavier Ward. Ward soon returned to Pittsburgh, leaving the young women to their work, and they would have a transformative impact on Chicago, a rich legacy of educational and social care. Their undoubted leader was Mother Agatha O'Brien. Born Margaret O'Brien to a working class family in Carlow, Ireland in 1822, she joined St. Leo's Convent of Mercy there as a lay sister in May of 1843. Earlier that year, the Irish religious orders had received a special call to send members out to minister to increasing numbers of Irish Catholic emigrants in the United States. O'Brien quickly volunteered. She arrived in New York City in December of 1843, where she and Ward were met by William Corder, just nominated as the new Bishop of Chicago. Two and a half years later, in May of 1846, she became the first Sister of Mercy to take her vows in America, taking the name of Sister Agatha at a ceremony in Pittsburgh. Four months later, O'Brien became the first Mother Superior of the newly established Sisters of Mercy Foundation in Chicago. She was just 24 years old. Mother Agatha and the sisters lived and worked out of what had been the Bishop's home on the corner of Madison and Michigan before moving into the building at 131 Wabash Avenue in November 1847 their home until it was destroyed in the Great Fire of Chicago in 1871. Education and social care were at the heart of their urban mission. The sisters got to work quickly, establishing St. Mary's School, the first parochial school for girls in the city, less than a month after their arrival. In 1847, they created a more select fee-paying school for girls, St. Xavier's Academy, now this was by no means a holy Catholic enclave. Almost all of the first students in the select school were Protestant, something that reflects both the intimate size of Chicago in the 1840s and interactive and inclusive relationships that the Chicago Irish had with other communities in 19th century Chicago. The money raised at St. Xavier's helped to fund other initiatives for the sisters, 
many of which centered on nursing and providing basic medical care for the poor. The walking nuns were particularly active in the summer of 1849 when a cholera epidemic struck Chicago, wreaking havoc amongst Irish famine emigrants living and working along the Illinois and Michigan Canal. In the aftermath of the epidemic, the Sisters of Mercy started the city's first Catholic orphanage, a haven for the children who had lost their parents in the sickness. The nuns also worked at the newly established Illinois General Hospital of the Lake, located at Michigan and Rush Street. Every day, the nuns walked north to the hospital and back again, often having to wait up for an hour to cross the Lake Street Bridge, then little more than a collection of planks chained together. They took charge of the hospital in February 1851, renaming it Mercy Hospital. Four nuns moved in, caring for an average of 15 to 20 patients in their first year. O'Brien worried that this is a great undertaking and I'm fearful and uneasy because an hospital is such an arduous effort. But if heaven aids us, all will be right. While Mercy Hospital lost some of its independence after O'Brien tragically died at the age of 32 in another cholera epidemic. It has been central to modern Chicago stories, providing health care for families in Bridgeport, Bronzeville, and other city center neighborhoods. Mayor Richard J. and Eleanor Daly, seven children were all born in Mercy Hospital. Threatened with closure in 2021, the city's oldest hospital seemingly was saved at the 11th hour and still provides care to a diverse and often underserved population. The walking nuns had a rich legacy in Chicago indeed. Now the Chicago Irish are also famous for their politics. Much of this reputation stems from the 20th century, when a series of Irish American mayors dominated the city's political landscape, leading through their control of patronage and political authority associated with one of the country's most powerful and or notorious political machines. This will be no surprise to any Irish American. For as historian James Barrett has put it, nothing is more powerful to Irish American mythology than the figure of the urban political boss. The late Larry McCaffrey once said that the Irish had a particular genius for politics. Nowhere was this seemingly more apparent than Chicago. The work that has been done on Chicago Irish politics understandably has focused on an era that starts in the 1880s when the Irish began to emerge as neighborhood politicians and ward level leaders. But there's a much longer history here. Irish politicking in Chicago can be seen from the very beginnings of the city's history, a surprising story linked to the men who worked on the Illinois and Michigan Canal. Now workers broke ground on the i &M Canal in July of 1836 part of a decade-long dream of connecting Lake Michigan to the Mississippi River. They finished in 1848, right in the heart of the Irish Famine. The canal itself was organized in three districts, the Summit in Chicago, the Middle, which ran through Will County, and the Western, where the canal connected with the Illinois River in LaSalle County. This was a massive project, and boosters paid relatively high wages initially to attract skilled labor. $26 per month compared to the $20 paid in Indiana and less at sites further east. Laborers and contractors came in droves. The state's population rose from 144,000 in 1830 to nearly 500,000 a decade later. Chicago and LaSalle, non-existent in 1830, quickly became two of the state's largest cities. The canal was essentially put together in two short bursts. From 1836 to 38, when the nation's financial crisis and recession brought construction to a standstill, and then again in 1845 to 1848, when the revived project provided employment for 2,000 Irishmen 
on the eastern end of the line near Chicago, work desperately needed in a Chicago Irish community pressed by famine era emigrants. Historians charting Chicago's meteoric growth have tended to downplay Irish canalers. Surprising given the fact that so many of the city's 20th century mayors came from Bridgeport, originally a canaling community named Hardscrabble. Now Irish canalers and their families lived hard lives. The work was physically demanding. When the ground on the waterway was not frozen, laborers dug year round, sun up to sun down. Their tools included little more than a pickaxe and a shovel. After grubbing the ground to free it of trees and undergrowth, workers essentially began the seemingly endless process of digging. Each section of the canal typically required a base of 26 feet, a depth of four feet, and an upper width of 40 feet. Pay could be sporadic, and no work meant no pay. Unscrupulous contractors, some of whom were fellow Irishmen, notoriously underestimated their costs and shorted their laborers. Some things never change. Disease was a constant threat, particularly malaria, and as we've seen, cholera. But for all the challenges they faced and the suffering they experienced, it would be wrong to see these as communities wholly of isolated and marginalized men. They were tied into networks where they could use their numbers to advantage. They were a political threat. Nativist opponents in Illinois certainly saw them as such. Anti-immigration sentiment was there also at Chicago's creation, sharpened by the growing prominence of Irish Catholic canaling communities. On the 4th of July, 1836, some of the leaders of the nascent town celebrated with a steamship voyage up the Chicago River. Dignitaries that included Dr. William B. Egan, an Irish Protestant Kerry-born doctor who had come to Chicago in 1833. When the celebrants got to Bridgeport, canalers showered them with stones, triggering a brief melee. The Chicago American took up the rhetorical cudgel against the Irish, sarcastically labeling the canalers as heroes of the Emerald Isle, and later reporting that an array of bludgeons, shillelaghs, and muskets had begun to appear in local elections. Anti-immigration sentiments in Illinois were clearly linked to the Whig Party, and the Irish in Illinois would lean strongly Democratic. And buoyed by Irish American support along the canal, Democrats crushed their Whig opponents in local and presidential elections that year. If there was nothing inevitable about Irish support for the Democratic Party in Illinois, it was a connection that would deepen in ensuing decades, strengthened by nativism of the 1840s and 50s. Now, despite allegations that they were transient, Irish canalers in Illinois were connected to significant political and religious networks. We can certainly see this in LaSalle, Illinois, where William Byrne, an Irish contractor, initiated a successful campaign to build a Catholic church, contacting Bishop Rosati in St. Louis. Byrne promised $1,000 for the effort and told Rosati that several of his contractors could do the same. Built in 1838 and then renovated in the 1840s, St. Patrick's remains one of the oldest living parishes in Illinois. Billy Byrne and his wife Sarah became mainstays of the LaSalle community, raising four children and playing an active role in the town's public life. Billy died in Chicago in 1873 at the age of 101. Irish politics in Chicago seemed to develop quickly in the 1840s. Recognizing the growing value of the Irish voting bloc, in 1842 the Democratic Party selected William B. Egan for the Illinois General Assembly, despite the fact that he had received fewer votes than his opponent, something that would be echoed in future Chicago politics. The Chicago Irish remained involved in Irish politics as well. In October of 1842, they formed a repeal association in Chicago, 
with Dr. Egan, incidentally a second cousin of Daniel O'Connell, as president. To promote the cause, the organization held the city's first St. Patrick's Day Parade in March of 1843, a procession that featured the city's Montgomery Guards, a militia company named after Richard Montgomery, an Irish-born general killed during the American Revolution. The Irish were a clear public presence in Chicago by the early 1840s. Now many of these same figures led the Chicago response to the Irish famine. A committee of community leaders called for a public meeting in late February of 1847 to take into consideration the suffering of the inhabitants of Ireland. While the meeting was delayed until March 4th, it spurred others into action, with Bishop Quarter calling for all Catholics to make contributions through their clergy or to send donations directly to the bishop. Over $1,600 was raised a total that was supplemented by an additional 2,500 in private remittances that had been sent in since the start of the year. The Relief Committee held a fundraising concert at the City Saloon in March and another event at St. Mary's Catholic Church in May. It was quite active. Most of the donations received by the committee or by local ward leaders were modest gifts of one or two dollars reflective of a Chicago Irish community that was dominated by working class people. Perhaps the most celebrated of these was Rosa White, a poor Irish girl who walked into the treasurer's office and emptied her purse to give six dollars to the relief committee. The story was printed and reprinted across the state and national markets, a melodramatic symbol of Irish generosity. Like many relief committees across Ireland, United States, and the global diaspora, it wound up its work later that year in November, 1847. The Irish famine, of course, continued, and Irish immigrants continued to come to Chicago and the region in numbers, expanding the Irish presence in the city and putting greater pressure on its nascent social infrastructure. The Illinois and Michigan Canal was completed in 1848, removing a widespread, if inconsistent, source of wages for Irish laborers. Many moved on to work on the state's rapidly growing railway networks, on the Chicago Rock Island Line, the Galena and Chicago Union Railroad, or the Illinois Central Railroad. Irish movement through the upper Midwest touches on my own family's story. We were part of it as well post-famine emigrants who lived in a small town near the Fox River west of Chicago in the 1850s before moving on to Oklahoma and then California where my grandfather helped to unionize the docks in San Francisco. A story with echoes of John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. Most emigrants, however, stayed in Chicago, piecing together lives in the fast-growing city. The habits and poverty of the famine emigrants appalled some observers, sharpening lines of difference and contributing to the growth of anti-immigrant nativism in the 1850s, certainly a sharp contrast with interdenominational efforts to raise funds for famine relief in 1847. The most dramatic example of this is the history of the American Party and the rise and fall of Dr. Levi Boone, a tale that also illustrates the potential power of immigrant politics in Chicago, rooted in part, at least, in the experience and growth of Irish canaling communities formed in the late 1830s and 40s. Now, certainly there was nothing new about anti-immigrant politics in Chicago. In 1840, 250 Cook County residents unsuccessfully petitioned the U.S. House of Representatives to dramatically tighten citizenship laws, part of a broader reaction against the rapidly growing Irish community in Northern Illinois. With German and Irish Catholics coming to Chicago in greater numbers, the early 1850s saw the growth of nativist politics there and across the Northern United States. Taking advantage of the disintegration of the Whig Party in 1854, anti-immigrant 
activists or know-nothings flocked to the newly created American Party, a national political organization with ties in such cities as New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Cincinnati, New Orleans, and St. Louis. In Chicago, Dr. Levi Boone, nephew of the legendary frontiersman Daniel Boone, ran as the American Party candidate for mayor in 1855. Running on a platform dominated by nativism, temperance, and anti-slavery, Boone and a number of his allies took advantage of anti-immigrant anxieties, and here's key, low voter turnout, to win the election and take control of the city council. In his inaugural speech of March of 1855, Boone charged the city's Catholics with being under an oath of allegiance to the temporal as well as the spiritual supremacy of a foreign despot. Boone then moved on to target German and Irish emigrants, ordering taverns closed on Sundays, a significant blow to working men who often worked 12-hour days, six days a week. On April 21st, German and Irish protesters flocked to the Cook County Courthouse battling with police for three days, the famous Beer Lager Riot of 1855. One person was killed and several hurt. 60 people were arrested. Boone's Beer Lager Riot, however, had unintended consequences, mobilizing immigrant politics in Chicago and fostering a German-Irish alliance that offered a hint to future politics in the city. Irish communities in Illinois and elsewhere would have to contend with anti-Catholic and anti-foreign prejudices for decades. In 1856, however, immigrant citizens used a by now familiar technique to defeat their opponents. They voted them out of office. The power of politics was not lost on the Chicago Irish and would remain there for some time. Now, the Irish famine long remained at the heart of collective memories of the Chicago Irish, something reflected in the Irish Famine Memorial at Gaelic Park. Stories of British oppression and Irish suffering became emotional touchstones or reference points for a variety of overlapping purposes in late 19th century Chicago, ranging from Irish-American nationalist associations to efforts to achieve greater measures of social justice in communities that desperately needed it. Finley Peter Dunn and Mary Harris, or more famously known as Mother Jones, used their own famine stories to push for change. In late 19th century Chicago, no fictional character captured the Irish experience like Martin Dooley, the Bridgeport saloon keeper and amateur philosopher who regularly commented on immigrant life on the near south side. Mr. Dooley was the creation of Finley Peter Dunn, a Chicago native who is the son of Irish immigrants. Dunn was a perceptive observer of the late 19th century scene, whose columns in the Evening Post provided both local and national readers with inclusive portraits of some of the central elements of modern Chicago history the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, the Cronin Murder of 1889, the Columbian Exposition of 1893, and the Pullman Strike of 1894. Often humorous, incisive, and cynical, Dunn used Dooley to opine about the Chicago institutions that were already synonymous with Irish American life, the Democratic Party, Irish Nationalist Associations, and the Catholic Church. He also talked about the Irish famine. Dunn used the famine as a kind of benchmark for the suffering caused by capitalist excess. While Dunn certainly was no radical, the hard times that the disproportionately working class Chicago Irish faced during the 1890s meant that Mr. Dooley frequently had good cause to look to the suffering of his Irish forebears. During the Pullman strike of 1894, Dunn compared the plight of the families starving because of George Pullman's greed to the horrors of the famine. Glory be to God, 
I can scarce go out for a walk for pity at seeing the little ones sitting on the stoops and the women with them lines in the face that I seen but once before in the parish over beyond with the potatoes that was killed by the font and the oats rotted with the driving rain. Dunn's typesetters famously gave him a standing ovation when he proofread this column and it's telling that he used the famine as a reference point in this most pointed an emotional column in his treatment of the Pullman strike. Three years later, in 1897, Dunn returned to the famine to critique a New York City socialite for throwing a costume ball where 800 participants spent nearly $400,000 dressing up as kings and queens. Mr. Dooley commented that Bradley Martin affair reminded him of a time during the potato famine when a landlord, one William Fitzgerald Dorsey, said, a justice of the peace and member of the parliament, continued living, throwing lavish parties while taking rents from starving tenants. One tenant finally murdered the arrogant landlord, leading Mr. Dooley to conclude that Dorsey was a fool. For Dunn, like so many Irish men and women, the famine was the lens through which hard times were interpreted and articulated. And the point here was clear. In both the famine and the industrial depression of the 1890s, a certain balance was essential. If industrialists or landlords pursued profit with no sense of mutual respect for their workers, violence and suffering would ensue. Not all Chicago Irish figures remembered or talked about the famine in the same way. We can see this in the life of Mary Harris, better known as Mother Jones, one of the most important labor activists in 20th century United States, and a woman whose life was intertwined with the Irish famine. Born in Cork in 1837, her father and eldest brother fled Ireland as refugees a decade later, settling in Toronto, Canada, where Mary and the rest of her family joined them in the early 1850s. Harris moved to Chicago twice as a young woman, opening up dressmaking shops in 1859 and 1867, the latter of which was destroyed in the Great Fire of 1871. For the next 25 years, she eked out an existence sewing dresses in Chicago. As her biographer Elliot Gorn puts it, by the 1890s, she was almost as dispossessed as an American could be. Poor, working class, Irish, widowed, elderly. Quite remarkably, she reinvented herself as Mother Jones, as an activist in the unemployment movement of the 1890s, becoming an inspirational speaker and an effective labor organizer who was closely associated with the United Mine Workers of America. She spent the remainder of her life fighting for a vision of unionism that placed unskilled workers, immigrants, and African Americans at the heart of the movement, becoming one of the most well-known women of the United States. She died in 1830, buried in the Union Miners Cemetery in Mount Olive, Illinois. The famine was clearly an important marker for Mother Jones, who liked to link her own family to rebel efforts to free Ireland from British rule. Ten years old when her father and brother left Ireland, she was surrounded by suffering in famine-era Cork, where sick children were everywhere and families died of cholera, dysentery, and other diseases. When her husband and four children died in a yellow fever epidemic in Memphis in 1867, her famine experience doubtless was an emotional touchstone for Jones. The death carts returned. Although she never spoke of herself or her family as famine emigrants, it clearly shaped her worldview, sharpening a sense of social injustice as melodrama, where the poor rise up to challenge their oppressors. As Gorn has argued, her stony silence about the famine revealed just how much the experience had scarred her and all who lived through it, giving an emotional charge to her political efforts. Her famous tagline, pray for the dead, but fight like hell for the living, 
speaks directly with the memory of the famine, providing a keen sense of the need to fight against injustice that had shaped the treatment of the Irish people during the Great Hunger. The last decade has seen a remarkable reawakening of public interest in Mother Jones in America and Ireland alike. Itself the product of hard work of a cohort of academics and labor activists with the support of the Irish government. A series of festivals and a broad-based campaign to have a statue honoring Mother Jones in a central Chicago location are testament to the success of these efforts. But they also speak to the power of famine stories in Chicago, reflected more directly in the 1998 Irish Famine Memorial Monument in Gaelic Park. The Irish Famine Made Modern Chicago. It was the horrors of the Great Hunger that brought thousands of Irish men and women to build the second city, its physical and social infrastructure, and its politics. But memories of the famine inspired many of those who worked to improve the lives of all Chicagoans. Immigrants, the poor, and those who had suffered during hard times. As we worked to build a better, more equitable, and inclusive Chicago, we would do well to remember the very famine stories at the heart of the modern city's history.